Sailboats use the wind to move across the water. And these out here are largely handmade to exact measurements at a family-run business in Western Maryland. Everything on these boats meets the standards that make them a flying Scott sailboat. Whether cruising or racing, sailors rely on the carefully measured parts to keep their sailboats afloat. Here at Flying Scott Incorporated in Deer Park, Maryland, they've been building boats by hand since 1957. Back then, Flying Scott designer Sandy Douglas developed the molds and templates still used today. Workers here use simple but exact measurements to assemble a sleek and simple boat that sails as well as any sailboat ever built. This boat is nearly complete and almost ready to set sail. We're going to talk with Harry Carpenter about some measurements that really count and how they figured out what would work best for this class of boat. It's very critical uh, when a, with a boat like this that everything be in the same place and the same distance from the deck and, and from the, uh, you know, the lines of the same length and also that the boats are all pretty much equal. So there's a whole set of rules that were set down by the uh, designer when he first built the boat and that determines what those lengths are and we have to carefully measure everything before we assemble it to be sure that those measurements are dead on. We have uh, jigs that we've made up or, or templates that we use to uh, determine the location of critical items of hardware on the deck and on the mast so that uh, the employees have an easier time uh, rather than using a tape measure every time and trying to stretch it out. You know, with a jig you, uh, you just lay it on there and, and all the critical marks are, are pre predetermined. This is another measuring device. This is called the mast step jig, and this is a mast step. It's what the base of the mast goes into. And the way they use it is that they put it right down on top of the deck in the position where the mast step needs to go. Uh, now, if all this hardware is in the way, you would see that this goes in here, and the curved part of this fits right into there and shows you exactly where the mast step goes. Here's another type of ruler. This is a hardware jig, and what they're doing is using it to position the jib track on the deck. You put this right here in this place on the deck, and it shows you exactly, if I do it right, it shows you exactly where the screw goes according to this black line on the jib. A Flying Scott needs 359 feet of lines to sail properly, just about the length of a football field counting the end zones. And that's not including the 150-foot anchor line. That's a lot of rope and wire cable for a 19-foot boat that's really about the size of a pickup truck. And someone at the factory has to measure each and every piece. Yeah, this probably isn't the best way to measure out 319 feet of rope, and a tape measure wouldn't do it either, but a tool like this really works pretty well. You just pull on it and watch the gauge as it goes by and measures out the feet and inches. If you had to measure a 26-foot mast the same way every time, would you use a tape measure? Probably not, and Flying Scott doesn't either. They lay their mast down in a jig with marks on the wood telling them exactly where everything goes. They slide this collar back and forth, and it shows them just where to make pencil marks to do all their machining for whether it's a mounting plate or for some of the other hardware that goes on here, the ropes and the wires and whatnot. Okay, so far, we've been talking mostly about linear measurements like length and height. But a sailboat needs stability, so that means measuring weight, like the 80 pounds of lead in the centerboard. This 80 pound lead weight is in the bottom of the centerboard, and the centerboard is used to keep the top of the boat from falling over from being too top heavy with the sail and the, and the mast and everything else that's up there, and the weight ratio has to be right between the bottom of the boat and the top of the boat or it's just not going to work right. And there's another important measurement that goes into the manufacture of a Flying Scott. Yes, it's very important that we maintain a constant uh, 70 degrees in the area where we do the actual uh, layup, you know, which is the uh, application of the fiberglass to the mold. Uh, if, if you vary from that, if you go up 10 degrees from that, the amount of time that you have for the uh, material to harden is cut in half. Wow. And if you drop 10 degrees from that, the amount of time you have for the material to harden is doubled. Wow. So you have to be very careful about the amount of uh, the temperature you know, in, the, in the room. And so time comes into play as well. That's correct. Uh, you have to be very, very quick with the uh, resin because you have approximately uh, 15 to 20 minutes before it goes from liquid to solid. So the goo they're putting on that fabric is called resin, and they use about 55 gallons of that stuff for every single one of these boats. That's a lot of blue goo. When you make a fiberglass boat, it's, it's a lot like baking a cake. Uh, the boat is the same shape as the, uh, as the mold, the same as the cake, is the same shape as the pan. So we put the uh, raw materials into that mold and it comes out in the shape of, of the mold and as it hardens then it becomes a boat. 
While this might look like a 19-foot-long pointed bathtub, it's not. It's the hull of the boat. And they're laid up much the same way that they lay up the deck that we saw them doing already. And that is with layers of resin and with fiberglass mats and with pieces of balsa wood for stiffness down the middle. And this is the centerboard trunk uh, that we've also seen. And this is where the centerboard drops down into the middle. Now, once this is fully cured, they'll pop it out of its shell and they'll pop the... Uh, They'll pop the deck out of its mold, and they'll marry the two together, and you'll have pretty much a finished boat. At that point, they just have to attach all the little metal and wood bits and put a mast on there, and you've got yourself a boat. The other thing that's important to have in the boat is positive buoyancy, which means that if the boat fills with water, it can't sink. So what we do is we put foam flotation in the boat that has a sufficient volume to support the weight of the boat and the crew, even if the boat is completely filled with water. All of the attention to detail at the factory pays off here at the sailing regatta. Sailboat races follow a precise set of rules over a measured course. What we do is we go out on the race course about an hour before uh, the scheduled starting time and we read the wind direction uh, about every five minutes with a compass and um, based on the average wind that we see because the wind is constantly moving uh, you know, on, on points of the compass, it might be northwest for a second, and it may go north, and then it may go northeast a little bit. Okay. And, of course, on a compass, those are all by numbers. And uh, well, with 360 many? degrees okay. on the compass, right? Mm -hmm. So we take the average wind, and we set that, we set the first turning mark of the course, that would be a buoy. We set that out at some distance, depending on the wind condition, like seven-tenths or eight-tenths of a mile. And... Um, we might set it, let's say, at 80 degrees on the compass. Okay. And then the, um, if we're running a triangular course, we would, turn, we would come back 135 degrees from uh, that first turning mark and set another one about, uh, say, seven-tenths of a mile. And uh, this is all measured either by the RPM of the motor and, and time running, or if we use GPS, which is very popular now, uh, the G we would set the GPS for that distance and that heading, the compass heading, and that would be the next mark. And then we would turn left again 90 degrees on the compass and set a mark that's exactly downwind from the first one we set. So that gives us a triangle. A nautical mile, this is somewhat technical, but if you look at the definition of that, it's the distance, it's the vertical distance subtended by an arc of one degree at the horizon. And that's what's considered to be one nautical mile. And um, when you talk about knots per hour, then that's, it's that how many nautical miles you can travel in one hour. And, and when we set up a race course, the, the race committee chairman, or we call him the principal race officer now, based on the conditions, he'll decide whether that, that first leg of that course is going to be one nautical mile or seven-tenths of a nautical mile. In very light air, it may only be a half a mile. And the reason being is that we have a time limit for the races, and so we try to set up a course that will allow all the boats to finish within that time limit. Okay, can you tell us how fast do these do the Flying Scott sailboats go? Um, in, a, in a nice breeze like we've had today, uh, when they're going off the wind and planing, which is when the bow comes up out of the water and it planes like a speedboat, they can get up to as high as 15 knots which is pretty fast, and, and the, the bow of the boat will come out of the water and you'll see the bow wave come back, and it will come back almost halfway across, uh, down through the, through the length of the boat. So the less of the hull that's in the water, the faster the boat's going to go. The faster they go, okay. the faster they go. From the factory to the finish line, sailors rely on the measurements made by the workers at the factory and the judges who measure the race course and monitor the wind speed and direction.